at part two of the Jamie Dupuy collaboration with uh, Dave and Tone here in the um, Tone Up Guitars shop, Tone Up Guitars studio today. In the studio today, yeah, we're watching this uh, edit that my, my editor made of the entire build process. We filmed the whole process building Jamie's uh, new harp guitar he commissioned from us. Which uh, is a 19-string harp guitar. Everybody's been look, searching for the 18-stringed harp guitar. Yeah, we this sort one of... is going to totally blow that one. It's going to blow it out of the water. We have an yeah. extra <laughs> super treble on there. You got seven trebles, so pretty much the full octave in the treble. I was going to say I was going to blow it out of the search engine optimization uh, <laughs> searches, but uh, because now it's going to be the 19 string harp guitar. Tone Devil 19 string harp guitar. We call this the NST model harp guitar because it says nylon with super trebles. Yep. And as we were saying before in video one, this super treble pocket, the whole super treble bank of strings was a very uh, unusual and uh, difficult thing to design and. Uh, actually, it's fairly uh, invasive. It's a it's involved, a process. involved process to construct yeah, it, as you can see. We talked about that last time, and, and I did all that dry fitting, you remember. So everything's dry fit. We glued up the neck. I think we just glued in the harp head you just saw Tone do. Now I'm actually gluing in this super treble tuner pocket tail block and block. What you see um, here in this in this frame is the rim of the harp guitar, yep. uh, the, the side rim. That's all the sides and the, and the block. The neck block, the the harp head block, and the tuner pocket blocks all glued together or getting glued together, and that um, that finishes the rim. It's just it's it's basically an entire um, outline of the guitar. Uh, you don't want to take it out. You don't want to do this without it being in that mold, the the, the uh, melamine mold inside of there. You can see. It yeah, that's an into. interior mold that we're using there, made out of melamine. So it sort of skipped the glue up with the clamp up with those blocks, but you can see they're all clamped up. And now I'm going through. Pretty much at the same time, once all that's glued up, you can just immediately put in the lining. Yeah. And that's that cool laser curved lining. Yeah, special thanks to our mom for coming over to the shop and pressing the button over and over again as hmm. uh, the laser machine cuts these, this uh, really awesome laser curved lining. And uh, you can hmm. see it's got, uh, ax it's got a bunch of uh, axes that it can bend. So you can... Uh, Not only is it flexible in the one direction, it's also flexible the other direction. So, which makes it really easy to install, makes it... It's a very strong and uh, large sized lining material. We used to use a solid bent lining that was mu not much thicker than the sidewall itself. Um, and this stuff is a little little more structural, I think. And uh, it, it's also very cool. It's a neat use of the laser engraver and um, uh, on that part. So. I think what really drove it was we started wanting to do purfling, which is an extra depth into the top that you have to route off in from the binding. We were doing binding and the lining was deep enough to have the binding route, but when you want to route in a little deeper to put the purfling channel in, we would do two layers of the bent lining. Mm. And so we decided, well, let's just come up with a, you know, a thicker laser curved lining that's already, you know, almost a quarter inch thick. So it's just one piece. We just put it in all the guitars. We pretty much essentially are doing that in every instrument now whether or not it gets purfling or, or not. But yeah, the, the binding channel is about the same thickness as the sidewall, but to do the purfling, like Dave was saying, needs to go a little bit deeper. Um, so now I'm just cleaning off the glue squeeze out on the underneath side of the lining. And I noticed here that you didn't add any lining to the harp, the, the super treble pocket side. So you're rim. about to find out why. So the next day I, I take the, the um, clamps off, the little office clips, I guess is what those are and uh, the rest of the clamps. Yeah, that part doesn't need lining because we're going to build the, what would be the super treble tuner block that's gonna fill in that little curved gap. So I, you'll see me kind of hand make um, a little walnut block that's gonna go in there. But first I have to, I go through and I think I prep all this stuff. I actually watched the first part of this video already. I don't think you saw it, but. No, I don't even know what's going on here. What are you even doing? <laughs> what am I doing? I'm hand, shaving hey, planing is that my microplaner that's that your microplaner <laughs> yeah <laughs> did you go steal that off my bench I took that off your <laughs> bench yeah it just it's a quick way to kind of take the overage of the lining and just smooth it down to the rim and make it all the same you know surface um, it's a satisfying job to do too to, to trim that with a nice little microplaner yeah you know it feels good to i would always see those planers like what the heck are these what do you even use these for so it's kind of nice to find those little uses for it. Yeah, and there's a sanding block to kind of trim up that whole surface there and get it to be completely level and flush and take all those proud little bits of lining and uh, trim those down, sand them down to the to the exact level of the sidewall. And then yeah. it takes a little extra... I've got a sliver there uh, in my hand. Of course, you get a little sliver. sliver. 
daily uh, daily battle that we deal with here. Taking those uh, block areas down uh, can be a little bit more time consuming. Yeah, you really got to sand those blocks kind of flush. So, oh, and then I got the little saber saw. This saw we've had ever since the beginning. This is my grandpa Jim's little miniature jigsaw, but I have not, we can't replace this tool that's unreplaceable. There's nothing on the market that's that small. It it's exactly like, the same. There's probably some kind of a Dremel tool that might fit on a Dremel that maybe, has a yeah. tiny little circular saw on it. I don't know if they make those anymore still, but I've been kind of pondering whenever that one dies, uh, we have to <laughs> replace it with something because we do use it occasionally on things. Yeah. Although it is a, it is a micro jigsaw, so it's got a bandsaw, a tiny little... You use a coping saw blade. I use a, I, yeah, I, the blades are non-existent for that thing, so I kind of had to come up with my own little blade for it, and I made some out of uh, old coping saw blades. So here's the block I was talking about, the super treble tuner block. Look at that fly over there. Yeah, there's it must a be it must be summertime now. I guess yeah, summertime. Or no, it's it's when the flies start flying slower. It must be late fall. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, we we shot all this footage over the course of a few months as we were building this instrument. Yeah. Uh, the, during the construction of this particular instrument, uh, we were going through this process of videotaping everything, which adds an, another level of complexity to, to the uh, build to the build process. So. Um, we're we're um we're still getting used to doing all that, and we'd love to do it more. We really like um, sharing all this stuff with you guys out there on in YouTube land, um, but it is quite a bit of an extra added thing. We didn't do it for a long time just because um, it's an added job. You uh, you sometimes get distracted with uh, what with your with the video with your production of, yeah. of you know content, and uh, you lo lose track with. Uh, it's it's not an easy job to build a, a harp guitar from scratch by Luthery hand. Luthery so. <laughs> is definitely highly skilled, and then so is video production. It's all yeah. pretty highly skilled, so doing them together is tough. But uh, you can see I just had to thin out that. It was a little bit too thick of a block, so I trimmed it down, cut it down on the bandsaw. Now I'm kind of using that spindle sander to get that inside edge right up to my pencil line. Um, I like that to be a pretty close match to that pencil line because that's exactly what I traced off the side rim. And then I rough in the outside edge. I want to make sure I leave it proud because you don't want it to be not sticking out past the side walls there. This particular block has to be glued in with an absolutely perfect glue joint. There, there's, yeah. there's no room for error on this thing, no room for any gaps. Uh, it's a very structural little piece in there. To, there's a little uh, bit of flex in the sides, so you can like... If there is a tiny gap, usually in the side, we always have the saying, oh, it'll clamp out. <laughs> yeah, it'll clamp out. <laughs> it'll clamp out of there. Right. You want it to clamp right in to uh, You want perfect... it to clamp in, yeah, not yeah. clamp out, but clamp in. So, yeah, and it sort of has a nice tight fit there. I can see already. Now we're just measuring that outside of it to kind of draw the contour using that template, the top template. Yeah. The, part of the design of this Super Treble Pocket was to keep the instrument looking very aesthetic and also traditional. Um, we wanted it to look like a guitar. Yeah, instead of having that extra it's, block hanging off the edge with the t tuners on it, we yeah. incorporated the tuners into the side. I don't know, can we patent that? Is that a patentable change to, enough to the guitar or to the harp guitar to say we're, you know, doing this new design for the two, uh, Super Treble tuners? There's not very many things that are could. patentable on guitars anymore because of the, uh, the length of time that, you know, stringed instruments have been being built you know hundreds yeah. of years and so patents have are all been um made and then worn out so it basically means that anybody can do anything they want they can copy any kind of a design feature on them but not that we want you to copy this design but this is just how we do it looks like it went in just fine it got uh, glued in uh, this must be the next day obviously so i'm just kind of uh, um, trimming it in so that it's flush with the side rim now just making sure it's nice there. So. Ooh, and now we're working on the top. This is All the, right. this is the Jamie Dupuy signature S19 NST uh, Western Red Cedar top, and uh, yeah, this is a beautiful piece of uh, striped Western Red Cedar that we got from I believe Raftrum, Idaho. Yep. Um, I think we got this wood from my um, violin maker friend and uh, mentor Arvid Lundin. And uh, we always like to give him a shout out. He's an amazing uh, fiddler, uh, local fiddler. He, he judges at the um, competitions and is an amazing violin maker himself and just an all around wonderful guy. Um, and uh, so here I am doing the bracing job of this Western Red Cedar top. Um, the, it, it, 
the design we chose for the um, nylon string harp guitars is a, a Hauser fan bracing. And so it's got a couple of lateral braces in it, but um, most of the um, most of the sound uh, production is developed by the uh, fan bracing that uh, is um, done in classical guitars. And uh, we integrate. I, I was able to figure out a way to integrate the um, the bridge plate. You can see me working on the bridge plate right now, um, and uh, I'm able to. Uh, basically kind of build this whole fan bracing assembly around the the uh, bridge plate so here I am putting some little finger braces over top of the fan bracing and op over top of the bridge plate and the bridge plate we decided was a fairly in important part of the bracing design of all of our instruments and um, they definitely it definitely helps support that bridge and keeping it keep it from um, contorting under the tension of uh, between 12 and 18 to 19 strings. Mm -hmm. So um, here I go. I think I'm using cedar for the fan bracing and Engelman spruce for the lateral bracing and the cleats and the bridge plate. So Engelman spruce is what I said, I think, right? Engelman on most of those larger braces there, yeah, and the bridge plate. And it's a nice lightweight. It's very similar to cedar. It's a lot more similar to cedar, I think, than it is to, say, Sitka spruce, which is a, a really dense spruce. So you have to kind of split those fan braces into three pieces there just so it flanks the bridge plate. That's yeah. your... Yeah, the, the fan braces bridge over top of the bridge plate. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, looks pretty good. Yeah, I, I I believe this technique I kind of developed after watching um, some more of uh, Fred Carlson's designs. Um, he yeah. did some what he called spider bracing designs in some of his instruments where he would take all kinds of tiny little pieces of cedar or spruce and just build little walls, uh, little, little trellises and um, I would call them buttresses and everything inside. They're kind of like a I'm trying to think a uh, lattice bracing. He would do it's kind, kind of, of lattice brace yeah. and then layer him layer him up and build them yeah. up slowly. It wasn't we, just a lattice brace. It was a, a like a stair I don't know what to call it. So here Tone is doing a dry fit now of the top now that it's all braced. Um, this this spot here I remember we were having an argument right here about something about how to do it and align it and and everything and um, Basically, you take the neck and draw the little lines around the neck there, kind of like I'm doing, using that orange colored pencil, and then uh, line up alignment with the center on the tail down there, and that sort of makes sure that you're true to the template. And despite our disagreements, as we still seem to work together pretty well, <laughs> <laughs> handing off the pencil for the other guy to do yeah. to trace the other half. I noticed we are starting to use a colored pencil to do the final um, line around the rim so that we can we can cut the cut it real tight and yeah. close to it so you know which one's which there's already a pencil line on there you want to make sure you distinguish which pencil line is the most recent and here i am cutting the top neck notch so last uh, on video number one we were talking about the neck top notch and this is the opposing notch in the top that that uh, puzzle piece fits into there called the neck top notch we got the top neck notch and the neck top notch I think you got it wrong. This is the top neck notch. <laughs> yeah, and then it fits into the neck top notch. Fitting in the neck top notch, kind of like a puzzle piece there. And we used to not do binding, and then when we and and we'd have to get that joint really close to where it came flush with the edge of the neck, where it kind of fits in there. Those the top would have to touch the neck, and it was really a lot harder to make that joint. Now binding gets fit in there, so we can leave a little tiny gap if if there ends up being a gap in there. It doesn't quite have to be as tight. But it looks like we got a good rim up and the fingerboard fits straight on the sound hole. And we can't forget to drill out the truss rod hole. We're doing a truss rod adjustment um, nut on the inside so there's no, um, there's no hole in the peg head to adjust the truss rod. So you access that through the sound hole yep. with an Allen wrench. And uh, yeah, we are installing truss rods in all of our, our nylon strings. All of our yeah. instruments. Uh, and they are adjustable truss rods, uh, two way adjustable. Two way adjustable double action truss rods so that means you can add relief or remove relief you know occasionally you wouldn't think it but the the neck bows back even with string tension um and it ha does happen on nylon strings a little bit 
more often. Yeah, there's not a lot of ten there's not as much tension on a nylon string instrument as there is on a steel string. So sometimes the structure of the neck outweighs the um tension of the of the strings and it doesn't pull the relief into the neck as it should. So it looks like we got a good fit. We glued it up, all the spool clamps in. We had to clamp the uh, tuner pocket spot over there. And uh, I think the last thing you got to make sure you do the, the harp head veneer, which we decided to wait on that because we were going to have him maybe do an inlay on the harp head veneer. Yeah, normally the harp head veneer, there, there's a little piece of walnut up there that, that uh, sets, that, that glues down to the harp head. And uh, sometimes that, that's a nice place to put an inlay. Uh, we thought we would offer Jamie Dupuy a, um, some kind of a signature inlay there, and he chose not to go with that. He's just a very traditional guy and likes his instruments to be fairly, um, you know, traditionally uh, appointed. And so um, we so just... What are you doing there? You're sawing off the tail block. So I'm access. about to do the rim sand in order to prep the rim for to accept the back. And... Um, here I am kind of uh, rim sanding it, but there's those blocks that um, are sometimes sticking out a little bit uh, too much. It doesn't, doesn't so. take much sanding, does it? It just, it's, the rim is real thin, and when you lay it down on that table sander, it just really does it nice. Some luthiers use a radius dish to do that job, but with the harp guitar, uh, that's a very, that, that would be very difficult. And uh, so we came up with a flat disc, and I have to kind of uh, mark and measure and put a lot of nice little pencil marks on, on the, on the, the rim, side on the sides in order to uh, profile everything the same depth all the way around uniformly. exactly yeah. yeah uniformly around so it's a uniform uh, uh, radius there's the li laser curved lining going in again of course so. another shout out to mom for keeping on pressing that button over and over again she, she <laughs> likes to come over and visit with us and spend a few hours in the shop reading her book and then she sits by the laser engraver and puts pieces of wood in there and presses the button so a nice mahogany back that's all prepped and ready to go for uh, with the book match for jamie dupuy's harp guitar here and it's about to get the bracing job done to it and i believe i use engelman spruce for all of the braces on that going down in the go bar clamp deck again which of course has that radius dish and there's a little bit more radius in the back it's what a 15 foot radius as opposed to the tops are a 22 foot radius i, I think. think you're right yeah that sounds about um, right so you'll see him in here um drawing that radius onto each brace right now he's just doing the little center stripe which covers which kind of basically cleats the book match seam um, so he kind of does that first then he does the bracing Oh, the camera's auto-focusing here a bunch. You can see you had it on auto-focus. Clean off the glue. There you go. Now we got the bracing going in. Let's see see if we can catch you um, drawing that radius in off of indexing off of the dish. Yeah, so the radius deck that we built, this go-bar clamping deck with the radius dish that the uh, back is sitting on, Dave made that using the CNC machine out of, I believe, some MDF board. And it has, like you said, I think a 15-foot radius in it. And so each brace then has to get a 15-foot radius um, sanded or carved into it. So you couldn't really see me doing that. It was kind of fast. But uh, there I go. Now I'm gluing it in, gluing each brace in and trimming out that, uh, that back cleat that, uh, that uh, reinforces the uh, book match. Nice tight fit there, yep. Using my expensive glue spreader. Your finger. Most expensive glue spreader on the market. <laughs> Nothing works better. I remember watching a video. Martin Guitars, one of their techs there, came up with a glue applicator that had a little roller in it, I think, and you yeah. filled pen up with glue, and then you just roll it on, and it supposedly puts just the right amount of glue on there. Kind of kind of good, good idea. Something you'd probably have to uh, either store in the refrigerator or keep keep it airtight. Have some kind or, of a lid on or it or clean, something. Yeah. Clean it out every single day and then refill it every single yeah, day. Yeah, right. You would something. have to, yeah. There I am rim sanding it again, get, getting that uh, lining trimmed up to the, um, to the rim. And uh, it's important that we get an absolutely perfect back-to-side joint, considering we don't normally put binding 
around the, the edge back. of the back. Uh, we like to get that joint just as absolutely flawless and perfect as, as you can. So Tone trims the braces. He draws another line on and then kind of trims the braces to, to uh, make sure they're not going to be holding up the rim or sticking underneath the lining. Some luthiers tuck their braces into the lining and you cut the lining around the brace. Um, the purpose being that lining will then t help hold the brace into place should it ever come loose, which it shouldn't ever if it's glued in properly. <laughs> so we sort of pride ourselves in having feathered braces out to the edge, especially on the top to where it allows a little bit more movement at the top, but we do the same thing on the back. We get a really fantastic bass response and mid-range response out of our instruments. And I think part of that is this bracing design. It's, it's very structural and provides a nice radius arch to the, um, a convex radius arch to the top and the back. And uh, it lasts for a, a really long time. It's very structural. But feathered braces all the way out to the very edge of the instrument provides a lot of uh, nice um, movement to the top and the back, which converts into volume. I believe. Converts into air cavity movement, yeah. Pushing a lot of air, get more bass we, we do get, at the harp guitar convention, we go to a harp guitar gathering every year, and um, we do get a lot of comments about how how massively loud our harp guitar bass response is and how beautiful they sound, so we're happy about that. We love to have a, a very devilishly quality to our <laughs> tone. Their 20th annual gathering is happening this year, 2022. I am on the board of advisors to the Harp Guitar Gathering now. Uh, so maybe some of you fans out there definitely uh, love to see you at this year's convention. Yeah. Um, so here I am building that headstock veneer. Jamie decided not to go with an inlay. We offered him a free of charge inlay, uh, so something that would be, you know, his signature kind of a logo or something. And he decided to go with a traditional. He doesn't look. really have a logo. I think is what it came down to. Oh, we could put his initials on there. We were going to put, you know, Jamie Dupuy in cursive letters or something up yeah, there on the Yeah, signature. He, did, he decided to just not do it. Yeah, he's kind of a traditional guy in, in the appointments of his instrument. He plays beautiful classical music, too, um, occasionally. Most of his YouTube videos are Here we are with the Jamie Dupuy S19 songs MST. that have been done. <laughs> Acoustic uh, instrument. Have, um, must be saying something. Six sub bass strings, six guitar strings, and seven super treble strings. You can see the super treble oh, string okay. pocket back there where the the tuners will go. Uh, this is what we call a closed up box. Uh, the top and the back, the cedar top and the mahogany back and sides are all um, all one closed up box, but you can see it's got a really proud edge area here. Yep. All right, so now we're gonna route off that proud edge with our very unique and, and uh, custom edge binding router. We had to design and build all this stuff. Part of that little unit that holds the router is a Stuart McDonald product, uh, but we've got it flipped upside down and uh, just attached to a different mounting arm. Yeah, to, so so that we could handle doing the giant sides of the harp guitar plus that um, area where the harp arm comes up next to the neck. I want people to notice the direction that we go with this. We, you, you only want to route the direction that the grain is running out of the guitar. And then we skip the sections where it's on the op opposing curve, and then you go the other direction. So we basically have to do two passes. There's one definitely a technique to routing the edges of the instrument because of the orientation of the grain. Yeah, it'll blow out on you, which would be right. very detrimental. And here's a really cool little trick that, uh, that we designed... Uh, Dave had told me that uh, I'm doing it all wrong. I've, all these years I've been <laughs> hand, ha cutting, hand cutting this, um, the binding pocket that goes into the neck block. The, the, the binding router we just saw doesn't go all the way into the neck, so Tone has to sort of finish it off, and you're doing it by hand for a long time. I just decided, hey, why don't you get a 16th inch bit, rig it up on the Dremel tool with a little fence, and, and uh, that seems to work pretty and good. Boy, is that ever a handy-dandy way to do that. It's a lot... A lot easier, a lot less uh, wear and tear on the hands. Yeah. And it, uh, if you do it right, it, uh, it's a, it, provide, it makes just a perfect little pocket. So here I am bending and, and um, applying and, and trimming the binding, the walnut binding. Um, most of our instruments have binding, but, but don't have purfling. We can add purfling to them. Um, but the, uh, the simplicity of just a, a hardwood binding is really nice and aesthetic. So there I am. Uh, trimming up the treble side and, and applying it with some glue. Uh, we use just a 
regular old wood glue for it so that it's very uh, traditional and pretty easy to do. A lot of people are using CA glue for their uh, binding and purfling add-ons. And uh, I think this makes it a little bit nicer of a joint. You don't see the wood, the glue between the, the, the wood when you use uh, regular wood glue. Uh, CA glue, you oftentimes see a black line between the wood, whereas mm. this just is a perfect joint. Yeah, there's different methods, um, especially if you're using a plastic binding, which a lot of luthiers do, then you would have to use some kind of epoxy or CA glue. I like the solid wood binding. I think that's a pretty big feature for our instruments, actually, um, especially if you get into like the figured maple binding, looks really pretty. Yeah, the next customer we're working on his instrument was has bought some really expensive snake wood. <laughs> something I've never had the opportunity to work with before, and I'm looking forward to it now, although uh, it's a little daunting because of the fact that it's so expensive. Very I think expensive. He, I think he has five to eight hundred dollars invested in just snake wood appointments, like the headstock veneers, yeah. fingerboard. Um, Binding, bridge, but, yeah. yeah. Everything snake wood appointments on it. So here's the inside harp arm binding. And I like the way that our binding, it's a, especially with our, our basic models, it um, our basically appointed models, I should say. It's a walnut binding, and it goes right up into that walnut headstock veneer. So it uh, blends really nicely, and I love the way that that chocolatey walnut, black walnut, looks against this the uh, yellow western red cedar and the mahogany. very similar mahogany color, too. It's just, yeah. I, I love the uh, NSTs that we've been building lately. It's just such a nice combination of wood wood tones. It looks very classical to me. Looks like you already bent the little piece that hooks around the harp arm there. That that had to be additional, bent additionally. Yeah, that um, we don't have that little bending jig added to our side bending mold, which we bent the binding on, and so that little curve has to be bent afterwards. Sort of hand bend it, yeah. But there it is, getting glued in and held with some clamps. It looks That's like nice. Dave's going to be working on uh, the fingerboard. Fingerboard. Looks like I'm doing two at a time. So we've got Jamie Dupuis' fingerboard here, which looks like either Indian rosewood or possibly Maybe Bolivian? Bolivian rosewood. Um, and somebody else's. Some. There was another one at the same time. I think we were building another one of these NSTs. Uh, before we were using a radius block to just sand the radius into fingerboards, but uh, Dave has yeah. since then started using the CNC machine for that. And then, of course, along with that process, he decided to start using the CNC machine for the fretting. And uh, Beans, this is a classical harp guitar. It has a flat fingerboard as opposed to a radius fingerboard, but still the tr the uh, the fret slots get um, cut in there with the CNC machine still. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a, a really tiny bit that you need to do those fret slots. It's about 0 0.023, so less than a 32nd of an inch uh, diameter bit. And you can see me here, I've got this method of just doing some uh, masking tape um, to hold the fretboard down. I'm going to actually put tape on both the deck there, the melamine, and on the bottom of the fretboard, and then I can just super glue them together and that holds it down to that deck without any clamps. I don't need any clamps, you know, to get in the way of the CNC bits. And we do have a pretty fair stockpile of Indian rosewood fingerboards. So we definitely have been really happy to have access to that. Uh, rosewood of any kind is getting more scarce and a little more difficult and more, and of course, more expensive. So we're glad to have a little stockpile of it to last us for the next couple years anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, there must be some audio happening here. Made five grand probably. Could, could have. No, they don't. They're not making those anymore. They're the most sought after banjo by all banjists. Gibson Mesh. Every bit. I got myself Granada. a Gibson Mesh. Don't look at me. <laughs> it's a freaking it's It was five grand, but now it's worth ten. <laughs> yeah, essentially, immediately it's going to go up. I mean, I kind of hate to play the thing because I don't want to... Oh. No damage it or anything. Oh, so. oh, are we talking about Dennis's but banjo? I can play Woody's. Yeah. Leave it here, put a pickup on Woody's, and then we can start using it in the right. In banjo the jokes. <laughs> yeah. This would be fun, man. Mandolin and banjo. Yeah. All we need is a bass player. Hire Lonnie. Yeah, Lonnie. Or Drew. Let's get Drew. Or Drew. So, basically, my harp guitar skills became obsolete because 
we decided to hire a bass player and I'll just play banjo the rest of my life. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll be a harp guitar player for a while, I'm sure. Yeah, harp guitarists are few and far between, that's for sure. So. Yeah, yeah. I think there's more banjos. But don't get me started on the harp banjo, which uh, I'm not the first one to come up with that idea. So here's Dave uh, routing the profile of the Indian Rosewood fingerboard for the classical harp guitar. And uh, as you can see, the CNC machine has uh, definitely become our workhorse for a lot of these appointment parts, such as the oh, hardwood fingerboard. He sort of skipped the uh, fret slotting part of it, but not too much you need to see there anyways. It's just a, it's a long tool path. Take, it's probably the longest one. I think it takes about 40 minutes just to do the fret slots with, the, with yeah. that little tiny bit. i got to go so slow because if you go too fast, you break those bits so fast. So now I'm just getting it up, making sure it's flat. I'm, I'm getting it up to um, 220 what, four, or 400. 400 or 600. Oh, he's actually kind of got this in the wrong order there. Looks like there now he, he is showing me cutting the fret slots. Okay. So those clips are out of order. That's okay, Tim. <laughs> you can just leave it. So there's the 2, 0.023. Yeah, the 023 bit. Yep, you can see it's it's in time lapse here, so it's going faster than it normally goes. But it's three passes per slot, or maybe four. I yeah. So as three. you can see, with the twenty fret slots, it uh, is going to take quite a while. Yeah, it's going a lot slower than that there in the in the. Uh, yeah, if you go lapse. any faster, it will break that tiny little bit right off. Yeah, and the way I usually tell I'm going the right speed is that you can see those chips, the dust coming flying out of there. Um, if you're going too fast, it'll like leave it in the channel and it won't have what's called uh, chip breakout. Oh, yeah, um, it packs the chips inside the And then the slot. that makes it even harder for the bit to go through on the next pass. So you, you just want to make sure the bit is actually working properly by yanking those chips up out of there. So anyways, now I put a little bit, once I sand it up to 400, I, I just, I wax it. I just put wax all over that thing because when I super glue these frets in there, it just helps keep that glue off of the fretboard. So was it, it clean. was it buffed before this or do you buff it after the frets are in? Well, when I first started doing this, I was I would buff it and then wax it. But then I decided, well, I'm going to buff it again after I fret it. So the buffing is essentially needless at this point. I just, I just put the wax on there to keep the glue off the wood as much as possible. Just go down in the slots. And so you're using flat or straight fret wire on this one because we've got mm -hmm. no radius to the top of this um, yep. fingerboard. Normally yeah. the steel string fingerboards get a 12 inch radius. Yeah, so we but have- the classical fingerboards get no radius, so we had to order special fret wire for them just to do a flat. Yeah, just to do the non-radius uh, fingerboards. So I just cut them by hand. Um, you know, this fretboard's not bound, um, so I'm just gonna let the tangs hang out the edge and just trim them off by hand. Um, so there's there's lots of lots of ways you can do it. Technically, I'm using a CNC machine, so I could just cut those fret slots shorter, not all the way through, and I could just start nipping the tangs off and get it, you know, to look to look like a bound fretboard. But yeah. that's just a lot more work. You know, we're trying to keep our prices affordable. Um, that's definitely something we could uh, experiment with in the future and offer that as a another option for people that are a little more particular about the appointments and, yeah. and how they look. But uh, Dave does a really good job of installing these frets and actually uses super glue to glue in every single fret. So they are just really solid in there. Some uh, some luthiers just press the frets in. It makes them maybe a little bit easier to get out down, down the road, but um, uh, usually a fret board, uh, frets will last a decade or more mm -hmm. usually you know a lot of times you see a guitar 50 60 years old that's never had a fret job done to it yeah and, and a fret job by i mean um in deinstalling all the old frets and yeah. refretting it completely and when you do that uh there's the the wood has dried out so much that chips you know pulling the frets out cause chips and and holes and stuff that you have to fill in later so um gluing them in i think ultimately is probably the best plan plus you get a really <laughs> solid tone uh, transfer. Looks like I had trouble with one of the frets there. I think I remember it. It was giving me a little bit of guff. I think one of the frets I cut was it had a boogered up uh, fret tang or something, so it just didn't go in. So I finally got them all in there. And Dave's really using that 
three ton press to put a lot of pressure. <laughs> it's on a one ton press. A one ton press. Yeah, I'll go back over them and kind of seat them again and give them all the same tension so they they get a nice flush. Yeah, uh, I have to be careful mount. whenever I use that thing because I get the I have the tendency to to over stress it, over push them in there yeah. and maybe crush the grain a little bit. I've done yeah. that in the past and uh, um, normally I'm busy enough finish sanding and doing other things that Dave's been doing this job. So once you uh, get good at doing a job, it's nice to kind of keep at it because you have a feel for how that job gets mm -hmm. done and you tend to be a little more accurate with it. You get the right order and you do it in the same order every time and it just kind of gets easier as you do it more often. So now I just trim them. Um, I just am sanding the edges of those frets just flush. Uh, just kind of do that by hand. Dave doesn't like to use the belt sander for this job because it's got rollers on it and it kind of sometimes yeah. uh, takes off a little too much material. Well, it's so. not long enough. The platen is not long enough. Mm -hmm. So then I was using it on the big table sander. I would put it on there. And what I actually notice is that it heats up the fret and then it darkens the wood around the fret. You get this little hazing around each fret. Um, uh, because I'm not it's kind sure. of burning or it's it's uh, heating up the oils of the wood enough that it's discoloring it. I think it's discoloring it with the oils of the wood just by the heat. I thought maybe it was the super glue doing that. And maybe it's a combination of both. I've had the super glue start smoking on me before when I've yeah. sanded. If I didn't trim the frets off and I was really grinding one off a lot, mm -hmm. a lot with the sander, it would it would heat that fret up and start smoking the super glue. Yeah, it looks like I'm using that uh, fret crowning file to do the edges, which I forgot about that. I. I think that's actually easier than using a, a straight file, which I've been doing. Um, so yeah, I put the bevel on it, then kind of just smooth them out real nice and smooth there, you saw. Now I'm putting the side dots in, which on this only get one side dot on the seventh fret. That's kind of a traditional classical style um, because it connects at the twelfth fret to the body, so that's a position marker. Um, but it's really hard to tell kind of where the seventh fret is or the fifth fret. So usually classical instruments only have one dot right there at the seventh fret. A little drop of super glue will hold it in there for the life of the instrument. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Plus, it sort of chemically cures with that uh, plastic side dot material there. Oh, yeah. Then I do the final buff. All right, shaping up so I'm that cleaning up the buffing, buffing wheel. wheel, adding yep. a little buffing compound. We sort of have one of them dedicated to fretboards. You can see it's gray, and then the other one is the yellowish colored one, which we do for the finishes. Finishes or, or just raw wood? Raw wood, yeah, because the gray is just, you know, it's all that metal dust and crud gets on those buffing wheels. So it always just... surprises me how much stuff comes off those frets. Like they're yeah. really oily and dirty and stuff. And they... Yeah. I suppose we could soak them in acetone or something before we use them, but I still think they are. Maybe. The buffing compound is actually an abrasive, so it actually does smooth it's them and gonna, sand them out. It's going to sand stuff, yeah. So, one of the final steps here of the uh, instrument being finished in the white, is which the means board. Bef before yeah. varnish, is putting the final two appointments on the uh, fretboard and the headstock veneer. The guitar peg head veneer, yeah. And my expensive glue spreader is uh, the applicator. To keep too much glue from oozing out underneath the nut, I... Uh, I or you sort of clean it off on the, on the neck side and then put that little extra glue on the fretboard. Yeah, just at the very end, just just so there's just enough to hold the fretboard down, but not enough for it mm -hmm. to squeeze out too much. So I'm sure we're going to get some luthiers saying that we're doing this all wrong because, you know, there's kind of a traditional way to do this. Most luthiers glue the fretboard on and then fret the fretboard after it's glued on because you're going to get, um, you know, some contouring adjustment to the neck and you want to sand that f level again before you fret it. Um, Tone spends quite a bit of time leveling the neck to the body with that, with a big sanding block. I think we didn't really show it here in this video, um, but that creates, that makes that neck just dead flat. And so we don't really have that issue. I, I like to have the fretboard fretted up first. Um, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of some um, leveling later uh, when you do the setup. But uh, we've had very good success doing it. If this you way. have a uniform thickness of the fingerboard and you have a dead flat surface that you're gluing it to, in other words, the neck and the top, um, then uh, it should transfer just 
perfectly and end up with a completely flat yep. fingerboard. So this is the final sh final shaping of the instrument. This is where Tone has to spend, I don't know, what's it take, about two hours to yeah, do it's all this? Yeah, a pretty meticulous job getting that scraping the binding i used to sand the binding on the binding down with uh, with uh, like 100 grit sandpaper and it just takes so long to get that glue off there that um sometimes you'd you know you'd just be spending too long sanding it and it's just hard on you so uh, i found yeah. some card scrapers that would do a real good job of that there's some of my um final shaping of the of the heel the back to the heel oh. joint there yep You just kind of hand sand that little bit there. I see. Uh, yeah. That's why you want the neck finish sanded before you attach it to to avoid having to do any additional sanding down in that crevice in there. It's yeah. really tough to get that. You yeah, know, the nature of the harp guitar with that harp arm so close to the neck and that angle and everything it just means that it's uh, difficult to, you know, access that area for finishing and, yeah. and uh, shaping and well, stuff. Well, which is why luthiers do a dovetail joint or a bolt-on neck, some other kind of joint that attaches afterwards. We just don't We just do not do that. This is our method. Um, it's worked pretty successfully for us, and it won't ever need a neck reset. So there we are. There I am finishing up the, the super treble tuner pocket, shaping it up, and it's a little bit of a shelf there on the, on the instrument. And okay, it's so next, usually. Uh, with a you know, screwdriver so you can um, change out the tuners if you need to. Looks like you might be saying something here. Yeah, we're not doing a time lapse here. Yeah, sometimes he doesn't time lapse it. That's okay. I'm assuming maybe you need that punch. No, I got. I, I think that's in there fine. I can I can trim that all up. And, oh, you just centered it there. Yeah. What we're discussing here is me doing the. In there pretty good. So let's see. Usually, what I do next. Trim up of the nut there so that it fits perfectly around is, the fingerboard uh, and the, the fingerboard. neck. I'll cut the neck up into the fingerboard. I might as well just. Uh, I mean, I should fix that spot right there. Yeah, we got a little gap by the fretboard here to kind of take care of. I think that might have happened. We'll get a little piece shimmed in there that will be invisible. I think that happened during the CNC. And then the rest of the fretboard yeah, here. Yeah, a dull bit on the CNC bit. machine yeah. gave it a little bit of a... Trued up. A little bit of a rough edge there, but once it's all sanded and scraped smooth, it uh, should be perfect. I like to, if I see anything like that, I like to fill in the gap beforehand so, so that as I'm finished sanding it, I don't, I'm not tempted to sand out the, the um, anomaly. I yeah. like to, I like to make sure that it's filled. Even if I do sand it out completely later, it's nice to um, leave a little tiny shred of that in there. <laughs> Boy, you're really getting a real tiny piece of mahogany to fit in there. Part of the finish sander's job is to uh, meticulously go over the entire instrument with a fine tooth comb and make sure that everything is uh, going to be perfect for the finishing, the varnishing process. I don't know why that piece isn't fitting down there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tough. A splice to do there. We filmed it. We must have wanted to show it in here. So, I mean, you you, you gotta you gotta show the good with the bad. You know, you gotta have the mistakes in there too, because it helps. You know, here's how you would do this fix. You would you know carbonized piece that fits just down in there, perfect and. You know, mahogany is so forgiving on this kind of repair because the such a sh uh, short grain that when you glue little pieces together like that, after it's super glued, it's just virtually impossible to see it again. So, but I suppose if Jamie watches this video, he could go. Hey, he'll start looking closely start looking at his closely. at his heart. <laughs> Can I see something there? A little anomaly there? Oh, you did the accelerator super glue trick. There you go. And probably what happened is I basically sanded and scraped almost all of that back out of there yeah once it was but i mean look at that i mean wh where is it it's almost gone now yeah 
really can't see it anymore there. Yeah, right. Hard to say. So now you can continue on finishing, um, doing the fi shape. final shaping, doing the final shaping of the instrument in the white. I always leave you that little eighth inch ledge there on the side of the neck so that that can get, you can, you can kind of round it into the fretboard. The, the fingerboard and the neck fit perfectly together as though mm -hmm. they're, the, they're the same profile, but there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a lip shelf. on the, on the mahogany neck that I can trim in and, and shape to the, uh, the C or the D shape. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where the handle of the instrument is what they call it, where you, where you actually hold the instrument and make the chords. Oh. So yeah, it's nice using that laser engraver for the headstock veneer. Yeah, but you have to rasp off that burnt edge there, don't you? Yeah, it's just it's a lot easier than it used to be. I used to have to take that little trim route, that little trim, uh, that saber saw, and cut the whole profile out of, of it out, and then uh, really rasp off a lot of it to to, yeah. to trim it down the to the to the other CNC part, which is the headstock. So now you got to drill the tuner holes in and the. As we said before, this is a seven super treble instrument. Has seven super treble strings on it. So we've got the uh, seven hold drill jig there. We must have already had. We must have already built one with seven, unless I made that jig for this build. But I don't I'm think I did. I I'm think pretty we sure we've built a couple of steel string harp guitars with seven with trebles. seven super trebles. Yeah. Uh, the the steel string instrument we make the S12 uh, has a different body shape and size than the nylon string instrument. As you can see, I uh, clamp that thing down and then r right over top of a couple of the holes, and then have to move the clamps yeah. and uh, drill those last holes out. This job always tends to kind of scare me for some reason. I'm glad you do it. You you do a great job at doing it, but I mean you're. After the instrument gets to this point, there's been a lot of work that's gone into the thing, yeah. and you're taking a drill gun, you know, and obviously we got these calls and we got the, you know, the jig and the stuff in there to prevent anything from happening, but, I mean, those bits can grab the wood and, you know, chip it out pretty easy. Yeah, so. it really sucks to have tear out at this yep. stage of the instrument when it, when a drill bit, you know, yanks something and yep. or catches on something and uh, causes some trauma to the instrument that you really don't want. And there's my, one of Here's my... Here's the first round of sanding, huh? What, what is this, probably 120, 150? I think I start to uh, to trim, the, because the binding is proud and has some glue on it from the top. And yeah. so I usually use 100 grit to knock all that stuff off there and really that. shape the instrument down. You probably got to be really careful when you get close to that edge, though, because you don't want to round over the binding and then... Yeah it'll thin it out so much there's i mean yeah. the binding's a 16th inch thick so especially sanding the rim you can it's easy to get the binding to be a little thin in a spot mm. so you want to be careful with that and it looks like after i've done the drilling and f first uh, stage of finish sanding i uh, i did the edges which i i yep. sand down with maybe some 220 grit sandpaper cuz you want just a nice little roll over to the from the yeah. top to the back and, or from the rim to the back and from the yeah, you don't want it to, to be a rim. sharp point cuz you you know your arm sits over top of that so yeah, looks never, like you might have skipped the 220 round and we're just going straight to the yeah. spray booth now yeah, so you can imagine there's a lot of finish sanding that goes into it there's a little more finish sanding that's what's videoed here about but. three different grits of sandpaper i think and then um, and and then some of that final shaping Normally, I do the round over of the edges right before I do the last 220 oh, okay. regimen of sanding. And there goes the uh, post out the, um, the yep. pickup jack hole in the tail. Oh, and you're going to put the first coat of sealer on the top. That's right. I, I had you do that on these, these couple of builds. This just, this just preps that top. Um, the first few coats because they, they dry really fast. It soaks in. You can you can basically do the, the first build up on the top because the top needs extra coats. We need a little side. bit of build up on the top, and so we just paint it on. Putting some putting some sealer coats as a base coat was kind of a nice nice little addition. It makes it kind of faster in the spray booth to not have to spray as many coats. Yeah, you, you get a little bit more build up when you paint it on with a paintbrush, and then of course you sand it right back down and. Put another coat or two on it. 
sometimes we just do the base coats in the spray booth. Dave just sprays them right on, mm -hmm. and we sand them out and spray more coats on. But this uh, process um, is, an, is another way to do that base coat. Oh, looks like I just woke up. I don't know. Yes, I must, it must be cold. I got my vest on. I think we were working through December on this one. This this build took a little extra time because uh, we were videotaping everything yeah. and communicating. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. So a um, little more prep. I must have seen some glue right there or something. Got to sand out. I I got a lot better lighting in here. I can really see transparent with with that light a little bit more transparently. But this is the actual first coat getting sprayed on. I usually do the sides first. This is just that same, you know, water-based polyurethane uh, finish going on. And it's a satin quality. Satin finish, yep. But it'll need three or four coats. Um, looks like I put it on a little heavy there. But this first coat, you know, it soaks in so much, you kind of want to put it on heavy. Yeah, that looks pretty good. There it is. Hey, right. coat number one. Well, after the sealer on the top, first coat on the back and sides. All set. <laughs> awesome, guys. Uh, the well, end of part uh, this two. has been a lot of fun doing the um, Jamie Dupuy mm -hmm. construction build process of uh, the S90, the new Jamie Dupuy model, signature model harp guitar. Yeah. Yeah, really came together nice. As you can see, there's a couple little anomalies we had to work around, but you know, you learn every time. You you got to uh, you know fix your mistakes and move on and um, but ultimately this was a fantastic build this you know really came together nicely um, there's really some nice pieces of wood we're looking top forward to doing some more collaborations with Jamie he's got a couple of interest interests in some of our other designs that we have uh, designed and haven't built yet like the arch guitar it's a contra guitar contra actually. guitar so it's yeah. a it's a harp guitar a classical harp guitar but it doesn't have the extension arm the acoustic extension arm. It's basically just a, a another, guitar body, uh, but a guitar body with a, a added reinforcement to the neck, and it has a bunch of extra bass strings. And uh, possibly we're going to do an, a, an, a steel string instrument for him too. So um, we're definitely looking forward to that. And, and it sounds like he's interested in doing some music collaborations oh, yeah. with us as well. So uh, we might be able to stay tuned for that. And if you guys like this stuff and want to support the channel, uh, we do have merchandise on the Tone Devil Guitars page. If you don't want to order a harp guitar from us, just buy a t-shirt or an awesome mug. We got this uh, really cool design with a bunch of our instrument instruments on there. You can get a poster or a mug or I think this water bottle, Dave's favorite water bottle here. He likes to carry around. It's got the same design on it. And uh, actually, I think I've got the... Uh, we got the other hat there. To Tone Devil nice. Guitar logo hats. Oh, yeah. yeah. This, the hats this are great. They're a nice embroidered logo. They, they look nice. Yeah. They last a long time. So, so the, this is the logo that we put on the headstock, our, our inlaid headstock, our Tone Devil Guitars logo. And then we also have this design, which is our certificate that goes on the inside of the instrument. So we got some of those products on the website. If you want to support the channel, that's a great way to do it. Leave some comments below if you want to talk about anything or ask questions about anything on there. Maybe you have a better way of doing something. Love to hear from it. Uh, we, we really like keeping in touch with everybody. So uh, let us know and uh, subscribe and send it out and share. And we'll see you guys for part three, I believe, is coming. We're not quite done yet, so there's going to be another yeah. part. Maybe if part four, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> it depends on yeah. how he cuts it together. But uh, yeah. thanks again, everybody. We'll see you guys next time.